Reasonable crew, so uh, we'll get going. You guys can hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Happy Halloween to everybody. Hope it's hope it's not too spooky. All right. So this is a download from somebody uh, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and a history of an out of the hospital arrest. And uh, this is the download that you've received. So uh, what, um, what is the next move for this patient? So why don't we go to, uh, why don't we go to Sergey? Sergey, what do you think looking at this? Uh, this is a typical download that uh, Josie and I will review in, you know, from remote monitoring, which has become very popular and very common now. Um, really has revolutionized the care of patients with uh, ICDs. Good morning. Good morning. Um, well, the, um, the section, my alerts, uh, says that on September 11, 2022, uh, explant indicator reached, mm -hmm. um, which I suspect means that the uh, battery is coming to the end. That's right. Um, and then I also noticed that the, um, in the section counters, there is, uh, less than 1% paste, mm -hmm. ventricularly paste, which mm -hmm. means that this device has not been used very often. So, um, <clears throat> would you expect that, uh, so is this a single lead or a dual lead device based on what you're looking at here? Um, I only see ventricular, ventricular, ventricular. So I would suggest it's a single lead device. That's correct. Um, and uh, would you expect that a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient with a single V device would be paced to any degree? Is that surprising to you? Uh, no, I would suspect that this is an ICD put in for the reasons of, you know, um, shocking the patient in case they go in a a heart-threatening arrhythmia. Would this be considered primary or secondary prevention with this well, history? It depends on the uh, mm. uh, on the history of the patient. If he had a sudden cardiac arrest before, well, uh, that's the the this says uh, out of hospital uh, arrest in the past. So is that oh, secondary sorry. or <laughs> in I big blue that. letters? Yeah. So this is secondary then. That's right. This would be considered secondary. So now you're looking at this uh, download. And um, so as the surgeon who has to change the generator, um, is this going to be a straight generator change or is there anything of concern? What do you make of the data that the device is giving you regarding the leads? Let me see what the impedance is. Mm. So base threshold um, seems to be okay, I guess, because it's only one volt mm -hmm. at 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0 0.5. Um, the base impedance, I, I'm not sure what are the normal. Um, right. that's, that's actually a good answer because every lead has its own normal. Uh, I think the most important thing is to really just look at the trend and make sure it's not changing. I think under 300 ohms, we would certainly have great concern in any lead, but most of these leads have their own particular range of uh, what is considered to be an adequate or a normal pace impedance. Uh, what is the, um, why do we care about the pace impedance? What is that telling us about the pacemaker lead? Well, in, 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 in simple lay terms that I, the mm -hmm. way I understand it, it's basically the resistance, you know, quote unquote, of the lead. So if there is increased resistance, there's more impedance. Um, it's, it's the ability of the lead to, 
to transmit the electrical stimuli and, and what is reach the muscle mm -hmm. and what is the uh what is that an indirect indicator of in regards to the lead so if the if the impedance is low that means that um oh you said if it's less than 300 then it's waiting towards i guess it's the uh, opposite um relationship so i guess if the lead has a lower impedance that means it might be broken yeah, and the extremes are the, the bottom line, Extreme. very low or very high, greater than 3,000 ohms or less than, th less than 300 ohms would usually imply either a problem with the conductor, the electrical wire inside it, or the, uh, the insulation itself of the lead. Okay, so we check the pace impedance as sort of an indirect indicator of the integrity of the lead itself. And as you rightly said, a pace threshold that is uh, approximately one volt or less would be considered an excellent chronic threshold on a pacemaker wire. Um, and now you might ask the question, since we're not using this device as a pacemaker, why do we care what the threshold is? The answer is simply that it is another indicator of the integrity of the lead and the system. Um, you know, we're always want to be sure that the patient's lead is uh, functional when we change the device, because obviously the last thing you want to find out is that after you've changed the device, the lead is not functional and that you've just in a done a surgery and, and attached a device to a bad lead. Um, the other last thing we're measuring is the uh, amplitude or the R wave what do you make of this uh, R wave uh, circuit at uh, 17 millivolts? Is that an adequate R wave, inadequate? How do you decide? Mm. Intrinsic amplitude. Um, well, I guess that's uh, based on what the EKG of this patient shows um, and how you know tall the R waves are. Well, is it the R waves or it's the electrogram, right? Oh, it's, sorry. It's the, uh, it's the amplitude of the electrogram. So uh, why is that important in a defibrillator, of, co of course? So that it doesn't undersense? Yeah. Then... Yeah. So you would obviously Based. want, would you want a bigger R wave or a smaller R wave in a defibrillator? I... The, sure. the way the pacemaker is set up to sense whether I want it. Well, I yeah, like- If you have a defibrillator, would you rather that the device have a large R wave or a small R wave? I guess large R wave. R wave. Right, yeah, you would want it to be large because the larger the R wave is, presumably the easier the device will be to uh, see what's going on. In other words, the likelihood of under sensing will be lower. So when we put an ICD lead in, um, if we don't get a good R wave, we usually move the lead. Some of you may remember that I, changed, I put in a new ICD uh, about a week ago in a patient, and I had to move the lead about four or five times until I got an R wave of about 10 millivolts. And the reason that I did that was because the device in that patient was a primary prevention device. And so if a defibrillator cannot sense ventricular activity, it's not a particularly effective defibrillator. So uh, in that case, we moved the lead a few times until we got an R wave that was acceptable. And um, I think in follow-up, when I saw the patient the following day, it was even as high as 12, which, you know, obviously 17 would be better, but uh, 12 is perfectly adequate. And generally speaking, in a chronic lead, we'll accept anything from about four millivolts and larger. Um, but we would really, in a perfect world, like to see it very large and robust like this uh, lead. And oftentimes people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because they have a thick heart, if the lead's put in properly, you'll get a very nice R wave. Um, and just to show you, in this particular brand of Boston Scientific, they have like this little sundial dis uh, display here. And there's an arrow when the device is brand new, it's pointing uh, right over here. And uh, as the device becomes uh, older, the arrow starts to move. And then it goes into this uh, orange area here that says one year remaining. And then finally it reaches the uh, so-called explant 
area, which is uh, sometimes referred to as the effective elective replacement interval. Um, and uh, so looking at all of this, it appears as if the patient has um, very good um, numbers. Now, this particular patient did not ever have a shock during the uh, multiple years that they had this device after an out-of-hospital arrest. Um, what do you think if the patient said to you, Sir Kay, well, you know, I, I had this device put in uh, eight years ago, and uh, I have never had a recorded arrhythmia on the device. Are you sure I need this device, Dr. Pass? What would you say to that patient? I'm sure you need one. Say that again. I think I would still say that I'm sure that he needs one. Why is that? I agree with you. Uh, well, because he still is at risk of developing an arrest again. Right. So, um, so first of all, uh, the, the probably the greatest predictor of having a sudden cardiac arrest in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is having had one already. So like if you look at almost every one of these calculators that give you your risk assessment, like the primacy calculator that comes out of the University of Toronto, which you can go to online and uh, enter any patient's data in, you'll see that if you've arrested yourself, if you've had a cardiac arrest, you basically get more than enough points to be considered high risk uh, for another event. Um, but, you know, this question comes up often in patients who have not had an arrest, people who have primary prevention devices. If the device has not gone off in the first go, does it need to be replaced? And um, in the adult world, it's been shown pretty conclusively that if you meet the proper criteria for a device, you still have a substantial risk at, an, at the second device. And so we would almost always... Uh, recommend replacement of a device. Uh, there are rare patients. Now that we have these new algorithms, like the one I just referenced, um, sometimes patients can uh, now be determined to have lower risk characteristics uh, on the newer protocols. But despite that, we would, uh, you know, you always have to take that into consideration. But if somebody had an out of hospital arrest, pretty much they basically bought themselves an ICD. Does anybody have any questions about this one before we move on? Okay, let's move on. So uh, this is an interesting tracing um, that I saw online at uh, learningecg blogspot.com. So uh, why don't we go to Dr. Marshall. Molly, good morning. What do you think is going on here in this uh, tracing? Good morning. <clears throat> um, so I would say first, just looking, assessing um, the rate for this patient, they appear to be bradycardic. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that statement. Like less than, less than 40 even. Um, <clears throat> And then let's see. What do you think about the rhythm? Yeah. Um, So looking and like trying to see if um, we're seeing in terms of regular, irregular, I'd say it has a little bit of very little, that one exception towards the end there, that premature beat there, uh -huh. um, that like second to, oh, I think your mouse was heavy. And then, yeah. And then we're also seeing that marching all the way through. So is this... Um... It's a sinus rhythm with uh, normal conduction. I'd say or... no. Okay, I agree with that. <clears throat> statement. 
So we have a P wave here, right? So we're yep. upright in one and uh, hard to see what's is going on in F. Here's AVF. You is that the bottom tell. one there? Yeah. Yeah, I think okay. you can kind of, it's a kind of a not great tracing and we can see yeah. the guy taking his picture of this tracing, which I guess yeah. shouldn't blame him. He was nice enough to show it online. Um, but we have uh, upright P waves in one and F. So we're in sinus rhythm, but are we conducting one-to-one? -one? No, it looks like... It looks like two to, it looks like your one is conducting and the one coming after is not conducting. Uh-huh. So uh, you were about to say what you thought this rhythm two was. Two to one. Yeah, this is two to one heart block. Um, so when people are in two to one heart block, um, is that first, second, or third degree block according to how we, the nomenclature? It'd be second degree. That's correct. It would be second degree. But here's the interesting question. Is it Mobitz 1 or is it Mobitz 2, do you think? And there is think... a clue on this tracing to that. Because let me just take a step back and remind that when somebody is in first, is in second degree heart block, right, you can be in Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2, or you could be in 2 to 1. And when you're in 2 to 1, we traditionally would say that it's challenging to know if you are uh, Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2. You are probably one of those two. But because they're in two to one, it can be sometimes hard to know. But in this tracing, there is a hint about which of those two this is. Mm. Um. And you mentioned it with the uh, what you refer to as the early beats. Uh -huh. I assume you're referring to here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so I think you would agree that we're conducting, right, on this, yeah. piece, right? This is like the first time on this tracing that we act. So we're still going along at the same sinus rate, which I agree mm -hmm. is about double the ventricular rate. Mm -hmm. And we do have this <laughs> one P wave that conducts kind of normally, right? And then again, we have a beat that doesn't conduct. So if this were a Mobitz 1, what would you expect this PR interval to look like before we drop the beat? It should be longer. And right. so it's not. So I guess that would be suggestive of type 2. Yeah, this would be uh, worrisome for Mobitz 2 block versus uh, Mobitz 1 because of that very nice little uh, gift that we received of that one conducted beat without PR prolongation. So, so if we is, didn't have, sorry, yeah, if, we didn't ha if we didn't have that beat there, then mm -hmm. we wouldn't otherwise necessarily have a hint of, because it would remain two to one, the whole strip, right? That's right. That's okay. right. Now there are some uh, little rules that people use rules of thumb, like the width of the QRS and whether that's more like, or the, the, the PR interval, if the PR interval is normal with a wide QRS, some people would say that's more suggestive of Mopitz 2 than 1. Okay. There's, there's different ways to look at it. But really, in reality, the only other way to know if this is Mopitz 1 or Mopitz 2 would be to put a His catheter in and see where the block mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what is the difference between Mopitz 1 and Mopitz 2 regarding where is the block in the uh, AV node and His Purkinje system? We're in Mopitz 1 versus 2, what, where's, what's the difference? Oh, I. Mm. If you had post operative block, is it more mm -hmm. likely going to be Mopitz 1 or Mopitz 2, do you think? 2. It's usually Mopitz 2. So Mopitz 2, if you remember, is generally most of the time infrahissian. Um, okay. So below the level of the hiss, and uh, Mobitz one is usually at the level of the AV node. So as a general rule, we sort of <laughs> think of Mobitz one as being a less serious form of block than Mobitz mm -hmm. two, um, and uh, Mobitz two, in most cases, would be an indication for a pacemaker, uh, or often can be, um, certainly more so than Mobitz one. Right? We see we've talked about this many times that on uh, halter or zeo patch we not uncommonly see some mobits one when patients are asleep and have mm -hmm. high vagal tone but you ought not ever to see mobits two in a normal patient so um so this would definitely uh be a concern i don't i don't know what the clinical situation of this particular patient would be but um you know if it was an otherwise healthy person you would look for 
uh, causes of heart block that are reversible, typically infectious diseases or rheumatologic disorders, or maybe uh, hypothyroidism or something like that. But if you didn't have any of those things, uh, myocarditis, I guess, um, if you didn't have any of those things, you probably would need to uh, consider pacing this patient. So, and if you were going to pace this patient, and let's say they were a teenager, would you uh, put a single or a dual chamber device in this patient, Molly? Um, if they were, you said teenager, I would do dual. Right. Uh, why is that? Why because, would you that? yeah, so I mean, just patient size wise, they're able to accommodate it. And if we're talking the type of heart block we're talking about that, we would have the ability to um, sense and pace both atria and ventricles. If they were smaller, like a little baby, then it'd be a bit of a different discussion. Right. So this patient has a normal uh, sinus function. You really... Uh, could just a sense and be pace. Mm -hmm. This is sometimes a difficult patient to program on the pacemaker because there is conduction right on every other beat. Yeah. So um, if you were to program it to sort of uh, pace, let's say you set the AV delay at, I don't know, make a number up 230 milliseconds so that you're giving the patient a chance to conduct on their own. What would probably happen is that you would have um, a sense, V sense, right? Like if you had a pacemaker here, this beat would be A sense, V sense. Mm -hmm. then this beat would be A sense, and then it would pace the V. Yeah. Then this would be A sense, V sense, then A sense, and then pace the V. Mm -hmm. That type of an irregular heart rhythm can be uncomfortable for patients uh, when they feel the the uh, their depolarization varying from beat to beat. So one would need to. Uh, you know, have to think a little bit, be thoughtful about how to program this pacemaker mm -hmm. to, so that the patient were comfortable. Sometimes, even though the patient is conducting, we might consider, uh, we might consider just pacing 100% of the time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but that carries its own risks of pacemaker induced cardiomyopathy and various other things. So is that something you would typically like in terms of doing the A sense V pacing versus exclusively A pacing, like something you'd discussion wise, or is it something that you would typically try and see if they report that symptom of like feeling uncomfortable? Um, you know, I think it would, it's a good question. I'm not sure how I would do it. I probably would try, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, patients have, uh, there is something called MVP pacing, which is uh, present in Medtronic pacemakers, which stands for minimized ventricular pacing, where in patients who have some conduction, you uh, essentially program the device AAI, and if it sees a non-conducted P wave, it will then uh, revert to DDD for mm -hmm. a period of time, and then it will again look to see if there's conduction after, let's say, 30 or 60 seconds, and then revert back to AAI. Um, it can do that, uh, but again, the problem is the changing back and forth, and sometimes patients... Mm don't tolerate that uh, very well. It depends on the patient, of course. Um, but um, I think in, I, I suspect this patient would ultimately end up just paced uh, mm -hmm. most of the time. Mm -hmm. That's not so easy either though, because if, if you notice the PR interval is pretty normal here. So yeah. you would not want to pace the ventricle early, right? You want them to have an adequate filling time. So this could could actually be a challenging patient to uh, to pace through a pacemaker, mm -hmm. so be an interesting dilemma. I think so it's actually harder to consider pacing programs in patients who have conduction versus those who don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a uh, five day old with a history of uh, prenatal SVT, and this is a tracing obtained in the. Uh, NICU. So uh, what is the diagnosis and uh, how would you treat this? Why don't we go to uh, Tulsi, Dr. Content. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so first off, in terms of the rate, um, looks about, let's see. like maybe in the 170s, 180s. Uh -huh. um, and then 
I see uh, what I think, yeah, I, I see P waves in one, two and AVF, but it looks like it might be um, not upright in one, but upright in two and AVF, so. I agree fully with you on that statement. What do you think about the morphology of these P waves? Yeah, they look narrow. Oh, the upright ones, I'm sorry, look narrow and tall. Yeah, they're weird looking, right? They don't, mm -hmm. they don't look like normal P waves in somebody. So uh, what do you think is the possible diagnosis here? Um, possible EAT? Yeah, I think EAT would be uh, number one in the uh, possible diagnoses. It, it could be a reentrant arrhythmia, right? This could be PJRT with a long R to P interval. Um, but what goes against that is the fact that the P waves are upright in the inferior leads. You would think they would be down going in, in that area because usually the pathways in these patients are posterior, posterosceptal. So, okay, so I agree this could be EAT. Uh, very good. Uh, not an easy diagnosis sometimes. Um, so what would be your first uh, agent of choice to treat this? So, so you see this baby, they say the baby's had some, you know, heart rates always seem to be in the 170s to 180s, Tulsi, you're going to do an initial consult. What kind of testing would you want to do on this patient? Um, would we do an atrial electrogram? Well, the patient does not have a pacemaker or uh, oh, any wires. So, uh, and, and you don't really need an atrial electrogram, right? You, you're basically doing an atrial electrogram in order to determine the relationship of, to make the atrial signal larger so you know what's going on in the A and then you can uh, you know, reference it to the V and try to help use that for a mechanistic diagnosis. But in this particular case, right, we have very beautiful P waves, very easy to see. You immediately uh, correctly made the, the right diagnosis here. So, um, so you wouldn't need atrial electrogram, but you know, you're seeing the patient for the first time. Is there any kind of testing you would wanna do to in somebody who is in EAT? What's our oh. biggest concern for a person who's been in EAT? Why do we care about EAT? What happens to, for example, heart function when someone's in EAT? Um, you could have a uh, decreased function. So you might want to get an echo. Right, certainly, right? EAT mm -hmm. is a very typical cause of tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy um, mm -hmm. and a very serious one, one of the one of the youngest babies I ever ablated uh, was a baby who was referred for a heart transplant because the referring physician thought the patient had a primary dilated cardiomyopathy, but they were in fact in ectopic atrial tachycardia. And uh, despite very aggressive medical therapy for like three weeks by me, I could never get control of it. And finally, I just decided to take the baby to the cath lab and we ablated the tachycardia because there was no other option. And the function was in that particular patient was horrendous. Uh, now that patient's heart rate was faster than this uh, and was, it was really more in the range of like 200 to 210 continuously. Um, but um, so ablation is an option, but we would obviously prefer not to do that. So what would you do? So you do an echo and uh, the ejection fraction, let's make a number up is 45%. So a little bit down. Um, so what would you do at that point? What kind of therapy would you consider? I would first try medical therapy. Uh -huh. um, I know, uh, I guess they're five days old. So I was going to say amiodarone, but uh, we run the risk of uh, hemodynamic instability with well, amiodarone. With, uh, that's true. With um with uh, IV amio, that's true. You have a small chance of cardiovascular collapse, but you could give it orally, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a baby right now upstairs in the NICU who, whom we're, we're giving oral amiodarone. So yeah, I would probably use amiodarone because it's uh, touted to have very minimal uh, hemodynamic uh, impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we could try amio. We could pretty much try anything here, right? We could mm -hmm. try a beta blocker. We could try tajoxin. We could try... Flaconide is particularly uh, 
effective for uh, some EATs. Um, could use sodalol. Sodalol is sometimes effective for EATs. And you know, as you know, with when it comes to treating arrhythmias, it's quite a bit of trial and error. And um, but those would be sort of our main our main players. You know, I often joke it's very easy to be an electrophysiologist because you use the same therapies for almost mm -hmm. everything. So you don't really need to make the diagnosis often. Um, it's only when you get to the cath lab where you got to get it right. Um, so yeah, that's probably what we would do in the patient like this. So very good. Okay, a key point here is that these P waves are very strange looking. And as you astutely pointed out, they are negative in lead one. Okay, do one last one found this in an old tracing from my uh, files here. Uh, this is a tracing in the post anesthesia care unit of an operating room in a hospital I worked in many years ago. And somebody wrote this word SVT here. Do you agree with this diagnosis? So I am going to ask Dr. Alfituri. How are you, Maman? I'm okay, good morning. Good morning. So you're, this is uh, this is what the uh, nurse has uh, dutifully. This is olden times where the nurse would actually cut and paste strips on a piece of paper, um, that would get into the chart. Uh, so what do you think about this tracing? Do you agree with the uh, analysis by whoever wrote that SVT? I would I would disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I see P waves in front of most of the QRS. Just sometimes merge into the uh, T wave. Yeah, I agree with you. I think this is just uh, sinus tachycardia, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they actually gave the patient uh, a denison. Um, and uh, this is, um, it's interesting that the uh, heart rate slows and we actually see what looks like pre excitation, right? Um, so this is the tracing of the same patient at a rate of, uh, you know, a little, uh, probably around 200 beats per minute. And then here we are uh, with the dose of adenosine. So, you know, adenosine causes heart, can cause AV block, of course, uh, but it also slows the sinus rate initially and transiently before there's actually often a little surge afterwards in sinus tachycardia. So it's interesting that when the AV node is blocked through adenosine and um, the heart rate slows a little bit, we see uh, pre-excitation here, suggesting uh, that the, you know, this is almost an accidental observation, right? This is clearly just sinus tachycardia, but because adenosine was given the patient, actually it uncovered the fact that there is in fact an accessory pathway, but this is probably unrelated to this tracing. You know, this is just a person in sinus tachycardia, but had they not been given adenosine, we would never see this, which is kind of an interesting accidental observation. So, um, okay, any questions? No, we're good, all righty. Uh, thank you very much. Again, I'm sorry I couldn't do the conference on Thursday. I wasn't feeling well last week on Thursday, but um, feeling better now. Um, so hope everybody has a great day. I will see you uh, in, search, in uh, sign out in just a little while. Take care, guys. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.